Are there any questions about the announcements or the activities in general before we get started? Okay, then we can start. Hmm? Uh, we, you all have a diagram from the previous weeks, which is page number nine, which has written on top the alignment with and the efficient use of universal energy. It's a diagram which is similar to this diagram here, which helps us to understand the basic concept between, behind all of the techniques used in yoga and the concept of the way of life that we would like to live in order to have harmony and health in our lives. The basic concept is that there is one source. Imagine that this is the one divine, eternal source of life energy, which has always existed, even before the creation of the physical world, and will always exist. And that this energy uh, moves through, creates in, in a certain extent, extent, and moves through, expresses itself, through all beings. This is a personal being here. So we can imagine this one light or energy source surrounded by billions of these types of boxes which are persons or animals or plants which are receiving this energy and then expressing this energy into the physical world. Now there is an aperture through which we receive this energy. We'll talk about that later. There are holes through which that energy flows off into other directions. There are certain blockages within our energy system which trap that energy and don't allow it to flow freely. And finally, there is the amount of energy which flows towards our life purpose. That each person, each incarnated being, has a life person purpose. The amount of the energy of that being which is flowing towards that life purpose is limited. It's not all the energy that we're receiving. A great amount of energy is lost in various directions which do not give us much happiness or health or satisfaction in our lives. And a great deal of energy is absorbed and blocked within the system and are not allowed to flow freely. So let's discuss what those uh, wastages of energy, those losses of energies are, and what those blockages might be. They're written on your paper that you have there. Uh, we see that one source of loss of energy is overeating. It is by eating more than we need to eat, we actually lose energy trying to digest those foods. And when we eat more than we need, in general, there is a lethargy, there is a, uh, an a inertia which overcomes the body. The body becomes what we call tamasic, and gradually this person has less energy with which to live his life. Another source of loss of energy is talking too much. And this is why the two main spiritual practices for people on a spiritual path are not eating very much and not talking very much. There's a large amount of energy is lost by superficial communication, which does not really offer uh, something important to us or to other persons. Now, in a, an essential, intimate communication can offer as much energy. We're not talking about talking in general, but talking that we do in order to, to cover the silence, our fear of silence, our attempt to gain affirmation from other persons, uh, to get attention from other persons. To, all of this, in a way, is a, a great loss of energy from our system without really offering us something essential. Another tremendous loss of vital energy is seeking after sensual pleasures, or in, in general, seeking after pleasure, happiness, or uh, security or affirmation outside of ourselves because a whole lifetime can be consumed 
by a person trying to affirm his worthiness or trying to fulfill this emptiness which he feels in various ways by finding a, the, the perfect person or the perfect job or the perfect situation which will give him this. The reality is that we can never be fulfilled continuously by something outside of ourselves. It can only be temporary. And the reality is that we lose large portions of a whole lifetime seeking after something which can never be had externally. Externally we can have short-term satisfaction, short-term happiness, but if we don't continue growing inwardly and developing an inner source of satisfaction and self sense of self-worth, we will never actually be happy. The fourth main cause of loss of energy is worry and fear, anxiety, in which the mind loses tremendous portions of energy, fearing that we will lose something, fearing that we will not obtain something, feeling danger, anxiety, and uh, this is a very exhausting, uh, emotionally exhausting for the mind and for the body. So we have four uh, large uh, apertures through which much bioenergy is lost, too much eating, too much talking, too much worrying and anxiety, and too much seeking outside of ourselves for security, for affirmation, for satisfaction, and very little energy then is left to go towards the purpose of our incarnation, the purpose for which we as spirit have created this physical body. Each person has incarnated for a specific person, purpose. Each person, purpose may differ in detail, but the main causes of incarnation are the desire for spiritual growth, the desire to learn, and the desire to serve, to create. I mean, if there are three purposes in life for me anyway, it's evolution, it's creation, and it's offering, it's serving others. Of course, this can be done in, in millions of different ways. Every profession can do this. It's just that if the person who is doing it feels and approaches it in this way. One can teach children in this way, and one can teach children mechanically. One can farm in this way, one can build buildings in this way, one can raise a family in this way, or one can do all of this without feeling anything and not really putting himself into that. So, there are also some blockages. Now, I would say that the two main blockages which prevent our vital energy from going out are a lack of self-esteem and a lack of self-confidence. When we doubt our worthiness, then we doubt our right to create and our right to manifest in the external world those things that we have within us a very important aspect of creating and of manifesting the power within us is to feel pure, to feel that we are good. And many people block to a tremendous degree their creativity and their power because they do not feel pure enough. And the second is self-confidence. If we lack a surety of our ability, one is our worthiness. It's the two separate things, our worthiness and our ability. If I doubt my ability to succeed in any effort, then I'm not going to make the effort because I'm going to fear a mistake. I'm going to fear failure. In studies that we have made with persons, we have realized that people fear failure more than death. I mean, there's nothing worse for a person is to, for others to see my failure, others to see my weakness or my need, or my inability. So these are two main inner obstacles towards the flow of our power, our energy, towards the goals of our life. There are also physical causes, such as a lack of exercise, impure diet, a lack of proper breathing. All of these can create mechanical blocks in the flow of energy, so that because we have low energy level, then our creativity is lessened, our clarity of mind is lessened, 
And so also there are physical uh, and energy blockages. But I would say that the main blockages are emotional. Now, as far as the emotional blockages are concerned, we're going to speak about them in detail as of next week as we get into the seminar on emotional uh, harmony. So what we need to do is, now there are various techniques available for freeing up this energy, except for the emotional release, which we're going to be discussing as of next week. There are exercises, physical exercises, breathing techniques, diet, g dietary guidelines, which, uh, meditative techniques, techniques of relaxation, which can free up this energy flow. And there are advanced techniques which can open up a greater flow from the universal source into the system. But my opinion is that it is dangerous to open up this aperture before we have established harmony within the system. Because if I just open up with strong breathing techniques or physical exercises, a large flow throughout the, the mental, the physical mental system, I'm just going to be creating more tension or more uh, uh, nervousness or anxiety or sleeplessness or negative emotions. So the first thing to do is to begin to remove the blockages, to work on getting free from self-doubt, from lack of self-confidence, guilt, fear, all of these emotions which may cause the energy to function in a negative way when this increased energy comes into our system, begin to close up these holes through which energy is being lost, that is, to put our dietary guidelines into harmony, lessen the amount of hours we're speaking each day, reduce the amount of anxiety and fear, uh, to cultivate a certain sense of inner satisfaction, find our goal in life and after we do those three things then we begin to perform advanced exercises which begin to allow greater amounts of energy into the system it will not be lost through worthless activities it will not be blocked and in, in held up in the system and it will flow towards the purpose of life just getting in touch with the purpose of life is an energizing experience uh, just as falling in love with someone is an energizing experience, falling in love with a purpose is an energizing experience. And we can understand that uh, in terms of a, a wire. This wire has the capability of giving flow to millions of electrons. But there are two prerequisites for those electrons, for that energy to flow. One is that it's plugged into the, the source, and the other is that it's plugged into the purpose. If I have this wire plugged into the source and we just cut it here and it has no purpose, it's not connected to any kind of appliance, not even one electron is going to flow. So someone can be connected to this source but have not found his purpose in life and nothing's going to flow. He's going to feel, why should I wake up in the morning? Why, why should I be happy about anything? Purpose gives meaning to, purpose, to persons in life. On the other hand, if I have a purpose and I'm working with, someone I, with something I love, but I'm not connecting with the source, I'm not meditating daily or praying or doing some kinds of techniques which connect me with that source of energy, I may exhaust myself completely in the purpose and lose my source of energy. So we need to be connected to both points in order to be in harmony. On the one hand, with the source, through daily meditation, exercises, breathing, prayer, relaxation, whatever helps each person. And then secondly, with the purpose of our lives. So that in a sense is the goal of this seminar. Uh, and uh, for those who go on to the second and third and fourth here, this, the main goal is finding out why I have incarnated and how I can align my life and all the details of my life with my life purpose and gradually remove more and more whatever is an obstacle to that. Now, in order for you to analyze your energy state, I would like you to look at page number 11 
in the sheets that you have, which is the observation of bioenergy flow. It's not in that set, in the previous set. This is the questionnaire number three, which says, observe your energy level throughout the day and record what you observe every evening. A, when, which are the hours of high energy? Which are the hours of low energy? After observing your energy levels for one week, indicate on this chart your usual energy level at various times of the day. Use the symbol plus for high energy, zero for medium energy, and minus for low energy. And you have a chart here which has from 6 a.m. going upwards until then ending at 5 a.m. Observe yourself. Now, it may not be the same each day, but I think that after a week or more, you begin to observe some patterns of your energy behavior. Why do we want to do this? Because we can begin by observing this to discover what factors are causing our energy to become low or non-harmonious, because it's also a problem to have too much energy and not being able to guide that energy or express it creatively. And then we may also want to have, after having observed that, employ some techniques just before the time when our energy is usually low, which will re renew our energy level. We may want to do a relaxation or a shoulder stand and a plow or some exercise or some breathing techniques. We may want to sleep a half an hour because it's really not worth functioning at a lower level of energy than we than we should have in order to function effectively, happily, lovingly, creatively. It's better not to function at all for 15 minutes, stop, rejuvenate ourselves, and continue. Many people just continue and they live a lower quality of life than they could live. If they just stopped for 10 minutes or stopped for half an hour, did some kind of exercises, breathing techniques, which each of you will have to discover what helps you most, and then continue. You won't lose time. I hear many people say, I don't have time. Energy is time. Clarity of mind is time. And we can do in 10 minutes with high energy and high clarity that which we could do in two hours with low energy and low clarity. And also connection with an inner source is time. Because we may have be thinking about how we're going to solve a problem for hours because we're not connected with our source and the moment we connect with that source by doing some kind of technique we immediately get an inner guidance and we save much time. The, the time is energy, time is clarity, time is connection with a source within us. So don't be fooled by the idea that you don't have time to employ at certain periods throughout the day these techniques. It is, the employment of these techniques, which we'll be learning on the weekend, is twofold. It's a daily practice, which we perform every morning or every evening or both, or whenever you can. It's a daily process, independent of whatever happens in our lives. And then there is the coping with the specific situations which come up. So we have our daily practice, which creates a basic level of harmony, health, and energy. And then when Throughout the day, there are periods which we feel lesser energy or negativity, anxiety, or tiredness. We employ a few techniques to regain our harmony. Let's continue with this, uh, observate with this questionnaire. During which periods of the day do you have the greatest clarity of mind? During which periods of the day do you have the least clarity of mind? Then it asks about the greatest inner peace, periods of the day, the least inner peace. And then question seven, observe and record the effect of how the various activities listed below uh, upon your energy level and the feelings of vitality. Is your energy increased or decreased after these activities? If the short and long run results are different, indicate so. Evening sleep. You feel better or worse after evening sleep? Afternoon rest or sleep? After deep relaxation? 
eating a snack, eating a light meal, eating a large meal, smoking a cigarette, drinking alcohol, drinking water, drinking a hot beverage, taking a shower, washing the face, arms, and hands, superficial conversation, stimulating conversation, affectionate contact with another person, sex with orgasm, sex without orgasm, yoga exercises, uh, gymnastic exercises, swimming, walk in nature, walk in the city, breathing techniques, meditation, prayer, expressing your emotions, expressing love. Now there could be a lot of other things which someone would add to this list and which you may want to observe and see what effect they have on your energy level. There's, we are seeing the body as a machine now this week, as a live machine, but a machine. And we want to see what affects that machine. Because energy is a very important aspect of our lives. Question eight. Are you satisfied with your energy level in your daily life? And nine. If you're not satisfied and would like more energy, consider how you can increase your energy level based on your answers to the above questions. Make a program for increasing and maintaining your vital energy. That program would consist of things which we have decided that we would like to do less or not at all, such as eating certain foods or at a certain times of the day. It may include things that we want to include in our lives, such as taking a rest in the afternoon or doing exercises daily or breathing techniques or relaxation or prayer or meditation, whatever, or dancing or drawing or singing or jogging, or walking in nature. Whatever you find is helpful for your energy. And we're not interested only in having high energy, but high harmonious energy. We're also not interested in having anxiety and a lot of uh, emotional tension within ourselves. Now, we're going to speak about some basic things that, which will help. One basic help with our energy level is contact with water. It is known that water is a revitalizing element on the physical body. And in yoga, many systems prescribe what is called the half bath. Half bath is the process of washing our hands, washing our face, in India because they walk barefooted, washing our feet. Uh, and this can happen before every meal before we sleep, when we wake, before we pray or meditate. And this does have a vitalizing and harmonizing effect. This is also helpful when we have nervous tension, when we're upset, and also very helpful when we're tired and worn down. Water has a very soothing and harmonizing effect on the body. So anyone who's not satisfied with his energy flow, he may want to incorporate this into his life frequent half baths and then of course a full shower daily and if there's a period of time in which we feel our energy becoming negative we may want to take a second shower <coughs> at that time of the day it's always helpful to finish up at least with cold water even if we start with hot to finish up with cold water with revitalize which revitalizes the body even more uh, another important aspect in harmonizing our energy level is exercise. And we're going to talk about some basic categories of exercise in a short time. And then we're going to show them on this weekend seminar. Then breathing. Breathing in yoga is associated with what is called, what is called pranayama, which is the uh, fourth step of the process of self-control, which is called Raja Yoga. And prana means energy, and yama means to control. Yama is the controller, the controller of life. He's the god of death. So pranayama is the control of bioenergy. It doesn't mean breathing exercises, but breathing exercises are a basic aspect of pranayama. They're a basic aspect of the control of bioenergy, because 
the prana or the bioenergy is directly associated with the breath. It's not just the oxygen that we take in. It's the life force which we take in through the breath, but it's connected with the chakras, with the energy centers. So by learning to breathe slowly, by learning to breathe deeply, completely, and by learning to breathe harmoniously with specific ratios of breathing, uh, by ratios we mean certain analogies between the inhalation, the holding of the breath, the retention, the exhalation, and the holding without breath. And these four acts, we can create a relationship between these four acts of breathing, and each different relationship, uh, timing, creates a different state in the body and mind. And we'll be discussing these ratios on the weekend, and which ratios are for gaining more energy, which are for creating harmony, which are for emptying the mind, depending on our purpose and our goal. Of course, in the beginning, the most simple ratio is one to one. That is, learning to make the inhalation equal to the exhalation, or the exhalation double the inhalation, because we want to always ensure a complete exhalation before we inhale. We'll discuss that on the weekend. But learning to control the breath means to, to learn to control the autonom autonomous nervous system which means to learn to control the energy and we learn to control the mind. It is the basic step in controlling the mind is learning to control the energy, which is learning to control the breath. And it's always a way of developing a harmonious state of energy. Another aspect of breathing are, are which, through which nostril we are breathing. That also has an effect on our energy state. When we breathe only through the left nostril, we are creating a state of lack of energy or re too much receptivity. When we're inhaling and exhaling only through the right nostril, we create an opposite state of overactivity of the nervous system. And we're interested in harmonizing that. And there's a technique which is called alternate breathing, in which we alternatively breathe through one nostril and the other, creating a state of harmony. It's one of the most powerful harmonizing techniques which man can employ. It's very simple, but one has to learn first to control his breath before he learns to alternate nostrils. Another means of harmonizing and revitalizing the body is the technique called deep relaxation, and which is usually done on our back, in which we progressively feel each part of the body allow that part of the body to relax and allow the energy to flow there. The energy is subconsciously blocked by our subconscious tension. So it's a willful letting go, trusting in life, trusting in ourselves, trusting in our environment, and being able to let go of everything and allow the body to completely relax so that the energies can begin to reorient themselves and create a new state of the energy body. The importance of this energy body in relationship to the physical body has not been yet understood by medical, by Western medical uh, sources. Some studies which have been done show this relationship. For example, uh, in a relationship where they photographed eggs, chicken eggs, with cur curly and photography, uh, after some days of the process of the growth of the embryo, they saw the picture of the embryo in the photograph. But they were very surprised because it was much too early for the embryo to have been created. And when they opened the egg, there was no embryo. What can we theorize? What can we suspect here? That the energy body, which is shown in the Curlian photograph, exists before the physical body. It's an energy blueprint. And around this energy blueprint, the cells are then guided to form the physical embryo. So what we have here, we have a consciousness, the consciousness of the chicken, or the consciousness of a man, a woman, which creates an energy field in the womb, or in the egg. This energy field serves as a guiding mechanism for the formation of all of the body systems. 
and this, thus the manifestation of the physical body. So the energy body is the precursor, it's the, the power behind the appearance of the physical body. And if that energy body leaves the physical body for a long period of time, then the physical body begins to de de deteriorate. We do leave our physical body in sleep, but there's a cord, a silver cord, a, uh, there's a connecting link which never leaves. But when we die, that cord is cut and we leave as a soul from the physical body and the energy body leaves for the last time the physical body and then immediately the physical body goes into decomposition. The only thing that is holding this physical body in this live state and prevents it from decomposing, which is the nature of matter, is decomposition, it's called entropy, is this energy body. And the energy body, of course, is kept in its state by the mind. So when the mind loses its harmony, the energy body loses its harmony, and the physical body loses its harmony. And the opposite happens. By eating improperly, not exercising, not breathing, and not relaxing, we create disturbance in the energy body, and that creates disturbance in the mental body, in our emotional body. So we create a lot of negative emotions by not living properly, and we create a lot of illness by feeling negatively. It's all one interconnected thing, and the connecting link is the energy body. So yoga is a very powerful tool which doesn't require a lot of psychology. I mean, it's difficult to say to someone, don't feel fear. But you can say to someone, do this exercise, your energy body will, be, will harmonize, and you'll feel much less fear. Of course, at some point, he's going to have to work on that and look into it. But it is a means of creating harmony in our life without having overcome, perhaps, all the sources of those problems. And we can limit, eliminate 50% of our emotional problems by daily exercising, meditating, and breathing, relaxing. And we also can eliminate a lot of psychosomatic illness. So this deep relaxation process, this letting go completely, allows for all of these energies to redistribute themselves. And you can feel that. You feel energies moving left and right and down and up. And you can just feel this happening. You may even feel dizziness at first. You may feel emotions coming up. You may feel like crying at first because all the contents of the subconscious may start <coughs> coming up. And that's why we don't uh, suggest that someone do too many hours in the beginning. Just 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening or the afternoon. We should never overdo any kind of techniques in the beginning. Gradually increase them as we see that there are no um, uh, side effects. So let us uh, talk for a few minutes about the exercises and how they work on the body. Now, all exercise helps, all forms of exercise. Of course, we should not overdo it. Uh, but yoga exercises have the specific uh, advantage of working directly upon the nervous system and the endocrine system, which creates a harmony in all the other systems. First of all, we remove muscular tension. Secondly, we increase blood flow. Now, when we run, we increase blood flow. But in yoga, we increase blood flow in other ways. We increase it through the deep breathing, you remember that breathing is the second pump which pumps the blood. The first pump is the heart, which pushes the blood, and the breathing creates a vacuum in the veins which draws the blood away. So it's breathing. All breathing, all yoga exercises are connected with the breathing. It's positioning. Positioning the body upside down brings the blood to the head, to the thyroids, to the pituitary, to the hypothalamus. It's pressure. In the shoulders, then I'm pressuring the thyroid. In the fish, I'm pressuring the thyroid. I'm pressuring the adrenals when I'm doing the cat or the sideward bend. So it's position, it's movement, it's pressure, and pressure is specifically designed to work on the endocrine system, on the specific points of the body, which are control systems for the rest of the body. This process of increased blood flow and movement creates a detoxification process in the body. It relaxes the nervous system, especially the static exercises. Actually, the word for exercise in yoga, which is asana, doesn't mean exercise. 
It means position or posture. So actually yoga is not what we do in the beginning yoga class where we move doing yoga. <coughs> actually, according to Patanjali, there are two aspects. The, an authority who lived about 2,300 years ago on yoga, there are two aspects of asana. It's completely stationary and it's effortless. That's all he says. It's effortless and stationary. So we take that position and we're confronted now with the tension of our body. And being confronted with that tension, we, can, we see how I react towards that tension. Am I going to fight against it? Am I going to let my mind go into other places and to create various fantasies? Or am I going to be able to play with the, the, the conditions of that tension to communicate with that, which could be pain, it could be a pulling in my leg, <laughs> pulling in my back, and gradually settle in. And by letting go, I'm not only letting go of physical tensions, but I'm allowing the energy to flow. I'm letting go of mental, of emotional tensions. When we come out of that asana, of that position, we're another person. That it, I've been doing this for 25 years now, and I'm still amazed by the change in the state of mind, in the state of energy. And I feel the deepest gratitude uh, for the existence of these techniques because they have given me the ability to have some control over my life. I mean, as a person, my mind is very <laughs> creative and very active. And if I didn't have these simple techniques to put my mind into, just into a channel to stop moving so much, I, I would not be able to create the sense of peace which does now exist in my life. So I'm very grateful for these techniques because as I said earlier, it's difficult to say someone, stop feeling fear or anxiety. But you can say, put your body in this position. Relax in this position. Work with this position. Where do you feel the pain? Where do you feel the holding? Can you let that holding go? Can you release that? And so we can work with our emotions and work with these blockages on a physical level which is much more concrete and much more possible for a person to work with them. I don't think that it completely eliminates the need for psychological work or spiritual work, but it is something which helps us gain a certain control over our lives so that we can go on to the rest of it. And the other effect is that, as we said, it works on the endocrine system and on the energy system, on the chakras. Now, uh, there are seven types of exercises or asanas according to their effect on the body. The first category is the exercises which affect the spine. So when we're establishing a routine for ourselves, a daily routine, we always want to have movements for the spine. And the first movement for the spine is opening, stretching upward, stretching the head away from the coccyx. If we don't do that, then we're not giving the freedom between the vertebrae that is necessary for the rest of the movements. So when we start out, we want to always free the spine. Someone could hang from a bar, he could do upward stretching in some way. The second movement for the spine uh, is from side to side. It's sideward bending. So there are certain exercises for bending sidewards. That's a limited movement for most people. Thirdly is backward bending. Fourthly is forward bending. And torsion, twisting. So these five possible movements for the spine. And each person, because the spinal column is the main telephone system, the electrical system for all of the body, this has to be in good state. If if the nerves are being pressed by tense muscles, or if a disc has slipped and is pressing on a nerve, or one of the vertebrae is pressing on a nerve, this is not only creating pain, but it's also disturbing the nerve flow towards certain organs, and so it's creating dysfunction, malfunction of organs. So it's important for this to be established, a straight spine and relaxed muscles next to the spine. So it's upward stretching, it's sideward stretching, stretching backward and forward, and torsion, twisting. All these movements can be done dynamically, they can be done statically, they can be done in the standing position, they can be done in the sitting position, and also many of them in a lying position. 
So uh, th there's many possibilities here, which we'll be discussing on the weekend. But you just should know that in your daily program, you should give some priority to putting the spine in good condition. The second category is head flow exercises. Uh, the contemporary individual has, almost all of us, have a problem with the lack of flow towards the head. And so the brain is not getting enough oxygen and it's not getting enough nutrients to have the clarity uh, which is necessary. And many symptoms which people have, such as headaches or uh, poor eyesight or lack of energy, is the result of this. So we have very simple exercises such as the half shoulder stand which we can put our legs in the wall and let the blood just flow down to the head or the prayer position or the yoga mudra or the, the forward stretch. There are various types of exercises which allow blood to come to the head. This should be developed gradually. It's very important also because when we are of our stance is usually hunched over and that creates tension in the neck and the shoulders and that also obstructs the blood flow toward the head. So the important is exercises for the spine and especially towards the middle and the end of the day, blood flow towards the head to rejuvenate the brain and the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. The third category is exercises for the abdominal area where a lot of tension is stored due to emotional tension and to poor eating habits. And so there are various exercises such as spasms which we do consciously or uh, a technique which is called nauli, various, or various exercises where we put pressure on the abdominal area which begin to detoxify this area and release the tension in this area allowing for more powerful digestive juices, uh, allowing for greater flow of heat energy, in, in general of energy from this area, especially for people who are, have low blood pressure, who feel weak, who their, their limbs are not heated, they have poor circulation in the hands and the legs. Very important to work on exercise for freeing the abdominal area from this tension. It's also very important for women who have problems with their period to free this area up. Then we have exercises for the joints, for the joints of the body, because there are also minor centers of energy flow in all of the joints, and they have to be freed up. So we're interested also in that, certain exercises for that. There are exercises for balancing on one leg, on the other leg, even on one hand, on two, the two hands together. There are exercises or positions for relaxation, lying on the back, sitting, lying on the stomach, and also positions for concentration. So we have these seven categories, and we will be interested in our daily program in incorporating uh, at least most of these categories in our daily practices. And each person will have to see whether he's going to be doing them standing or sitting or lying, for what period of time, which time of the day, as a preparation of his body in proper energy flow. Now, we can also separate exercise into dynamic and static. Dynamic exercises are done in conjunction with the breathing. All upward movements and backward movements are accompanied by inhalation. Forward movements, there are a few exceptions to this in general. Forward movements and downward movements are accompanied by exhalation because by closing the abdomen we are closing the lungs and it's very natural. There are some exceptions to that. And in general, the beginner does more dynamic exercises in order to create more suppleness and preparation of the body. And as he goes on, he practices more the static postures. In general, we do more dynamic exercises in the morning or when it's cold out in order to prepare the body for its movement throughout the day. And usually the static exercise we have more for the evening or when it's hotter. But all of these are subject to change and to uh, your choice in life to see what helps you more uh, in your daily life. 
I would say that this process of exercising, breathing and relaxation or meditation or prayer at the end is like driving a car and first gear is the exercises and second gear is the breathing and third gear is the relaxation or the meditation or the prayer and so if we try to go to third gear immediately we will have perhaps some results but they may not it may not be so easy to relax or so easy to meditate if I haven't previously done some exercises or some breathing one leads to the other the breathing will be easier after the exercises the meditation will be easier easier after the breathing which does not mean that you couldn't just do a meditation by itself or breathing by itself but in general there is this flow which is helpful so details for this and the experience of these techniques we will get into on the weekend so concluding for today uh, we are not helpless in the control and the creation of our bioenergy system there are many things that we can do we have been blessed with the knowledge of these techniques and for me it's a shame for someone to know that there are techniques which he can employ in his life which can improve the quality of his life because energy means quality also in feelings and loving and creating and working whatever he does and not to employ them and it's really a shame it's not very intelligent I mean I don't love myself if I'm not willing to give myself that very simple gift of a higher quality life through a higher quality of energy which will eventually lead me to a higher quality of thinking a more relaxed and clear mind and eventually spiritual growth uh, so I encourage you to create a period of time in your daily program in which you will begin to employ these techniques in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, choose it yourself, two times a day is even better, in which you do some exercises, some breathing techniques, and some form of letting go, whether that's called relaxation or prayer or meditation, it's up to you to choose that, and some combination of that. Any questions that you have about the, uh, the question of bioenergy and regulating this bioenergy in our lives? Tony. Question. How does participating in sports can be balanced and harmonious with the bioenergy? Mm -hmm. Because you said about static uh, movement exercises mm -hmm. or movement is more dynamic. Mm -hmm. Where do you put sports? How can that fit in the harmony? Uh, I think sports, which is a daily movement of the body, is beneficial. The, the only thing that one would have to, I mean, it helps the bioenergy to flow and it keeps the body healthy. One would just have to be careful about overdoing it, the, the effects of overdoing uh, some forms of, ex some, form, some movements which may create uh, inflammations or bruising in some parts of the body or overuse of, of some cells which may create problems. I mean, otherwise, uh, as a way of life, Participating in sports is also releasing emotionally. It's also satisfying. Yeah. And it does all of that which we said earlier. When we just have to watch out for overdoing it. And if it's a competitive sport, uh, for the tension which might be created, the emotional tension which might be created in worrying about the result. Is there a point that uh, someone can see inside himself to see if it's too much or where does it go to? Overdoing it. Well, inflammation is one sign. Uh, tiredness of the body is another sign. Uh, losing our love for that, we, that which we are doing is another sign that we just we, we wake up and not feel like doing it today. Bru uh, bruising of the body would be another sign. I remember when I first started yoga, and I had been playing a lot of basketball before that, and football and uh, I found that it was conflicting in my muscles but then as time went by and I was doing both then there was no conflict but in the beginning uh, my muscles were confused whether they're going to stretch or, or, or uh, contract what they're going to do but I found that the body could accept both disciplines 
but in the beginning there was some conflict. Any other questions? Okay, then I hope and I encourage uh, that you will begin to put this into your lives on a daily basis. Okay, We can form our groups now. Is there anyone who, who is here for the first time today? Doesn't know which group he's in?